For 2,000 years, the ruins of an ancient city have lain scattered on this hill. The ruins of a civilization unrecorded in the history of time. North Africa stands as a symbol of the darkest places in the story of man. She was once his birthplace and his only world. Here, primitive man wandered over the trackless wastes. And down through the centuries of progress and civilization, this land has stood resplendent with stoicism to receive the conqueror. Here, battle cries filled the air. And now they are lost in space, lost with the legions who shouted them. A thousand years before the birth of Christ, the pharaoh Nico ordered the Phoenicians to circumnavigate the continent. Out of these years of exploration sprang the ancient city of Carthage. In Africa's other ancient cities stands the architecture of all the ages and all its conquerors. Where the most modern buildings rub shoulders with Moorish and Oriental temples. Here, as in the days of Christ, the same toiling people live out their simple lives. Their marketplaces are crowded, mean, and miserable. Their lives bear witness to the fate that comes to all conquered nations. Here are the fusions of every race, creed, and color. The stoicism and hopelessness of men who once were noble and free. In ancient Rome, a senator stood up and cried, Carthage must be destroyed. Not a stone must be left standing upon another stone. Today, a new conqueror comes to Carthage with a weapon so deadly it could blast the ageless ruins of the city into unrecognizable rubble in the fraction of a moment. Yes, Carthage has known many conquerors, soldiers whose boots have pounded ancient flagstones. But these must be the strangest group of warriors that ever came to Africa. They're Yanks. And they're seeing a world they once knew only from geography class and travelogues. They're going to have plenty to show and tell the folks back home. Yes, home. Only a few years ago, they were high school kids. Or divinity students. Or gas station attendants. Boys who never dreamed they'd ever set foot where Roman armies once burned and looted and pillaged. Out of the misery and terror that befell its people, all that remains are straggling bunches of wildflowers. Tribute to a might that can never rise again. It's no use. Yanks are born tourists, and they just can't quit, even in the middle of a war. For the first time, these boys from Iowa, Kansas, New Jersey, California, came face to face with Bedouins, Moors, and Senegalese. They found that the African natives were not really so different after all, despite their strange clothes and foreign customs. Almost without realizing it, these soldiers spread an air of friendliness and goodwill that has left an everlasting impression. Remember the way our boys massacred the French language after the last war? Well, they're learning Arabic in this one. And you can imagine what they'll do to that. The boys from Coney Island, Santa Monica, from the shores of every lake and stream in the land, head naturally for the beach, the magnificent Mediterranean. And it would be as good as home if there was only an old grapefruit or banana peel floating around somewhere. Remember when all this belonged to Mussolini? Mare Nostrum, he called it then. Ah, see. Scattered all over Africa are the remnants of another proud army of conquerors. Rommel's Africa Corps and the German Luftwaffe. A world that thousands of young Germans will never know. A world which, in their barbaric desires, they could never achieve above the countless graves of these young Germans, standing in mocking tribute, are the mute evidences of their own disaster. Planes, tanks, trucks, guns, ammunition. Silent, immobile, impotent. They rest like the men beneath them, never again to threaten decency and human life. All over Africa, captured Axis airfields and bases were reconstructed and rebuilt by these same young Americans a job that must be accomplished quickly and decisively. The same spirit of imagination and initiative that built America is employed on the desert sands of this faraway country. New quarters must be built because the enemy knows the position of the ones they left behind. Left behind with a pooch whose grandmother came over from Bavaria and started her own super race. 
Yes, it's pretty tough going. And there wasn't a man over there who didn't think constantly of his own room at home. Of clean sheets and hot and cold running water. They didn't know it before, but it can get colder on the desert than almost anywhere in the world. And hotter. And when it came to eating, it wasn't exactly the Ritz. It wasn't even the local lunch wagon on Main Street. It's true, there were no ration points to worry about, and no standing in line for food. Well, not much. And every night after a hearty meal, you could sit down in a big easy chair next to the radio. You could light up your pipe and read the evening paper and listen to Bing Crosby or Information Please while the little woman did the dishes and cleaned up. These men didn't just fight the Germans and Italians. They fought dust and germs and wind and sun and cold 24 hours a day. This particular bunch called themselves the Earthquakers and were part of the 12th Medium Bombardment Group of our 9th Air Force. For weeks, they flew missions over hundreds of miles of African desert and mountains and chased Rommel until they ran him into the ground at Tunisia. As the campaign stretched out, this group, along with many others, found themselves constantly replacing their ranks. New strength to finish up what had been started by our enemies. Just American guys from all over, from farms, ranches, and factories, from a place called the USA that they hadn't seen in months and wonder when they're going to see again. The men seemed almost easier to replace than the valuable planes and equipment that would finally finish the Axis in Africa. Every available part, every nut and bolt, every piece of equipment that could possibly be salvaged was painstakingly removed from ships that could no longer fly. No, our planes and men were not invulnerable in Africa. And many a proud ship staggered back to its base, only to be dismantled and used again, piece by piece, as it was needed. Not enough can be said for the men of the ground crews, the men who kept them flying every day and every night. Whether it was a rudder torn off by flak, a landing gear shot away by 37 millimeter cannon, or an engine that had caught fire and burnt to a crisp, the men in the ground crews fixed and patched and repaired and performed miracles so they could fly again. No smooth running assembly line, no spare parts department, nothing except what could be salvaged, not once, but 10 times. The planes were North American Billy Mitchells, B-25s, and the name Earthquakers fits them like a glove. They're the same kind the Air Force used to bomb Tokyo. And in North Africa, they shook the land from one end to the other. Shook it, jarred it, jolted it, hammered it, smashed it, leveled it, pounded it and quaked it until Rommel and the Africa Corps just couldn't take it anymore. Here is the situation at this stage of the campaign. It gives a better understanding of the task facing the Earthquakers. Toward the beginning of the end, the enemy still held Tunis and Bizerta. Allied strategy decided to force the Germans and Italians up toward this narrow peninsula into annihilation or surrender. American and French forces began to push hard from the west and southwest. The Earthquakers and part of the 8th Army under General Montgomery were driving from the east and southeast. One of the many objectives to be destroyed was the Nazi airfield at El Moog in the city of Sfax. From Medinin, almost a hundred miles away, the Earthquakers made their plans. Cautious, laborious plans, since bombing and destroying enemy airfields and bases are not accomplished one, two, three. Countless briefings and interrogations were held. Areas were mapped out down to feet and inches, so the targets might be clearly determined. These are no longer young Americans at play on the sightseeing tour. They're soldiers part of the Army Air Forces. Before you can ride camels and donkeys, you've got to move in and take over. That is, if the camels and donkeys happen to be in enemy territory. Day after day, they flew combat missions with systematic plans for destruction. This was what they had been trained for. This was what they had known they were meant to do. And now, the bombs and bullets were headed where they belonged. Headed for enemy airdromes and tank corps, and German panzer divisions. A steady, monotonous, relentless job, devoid of comfort and filled with danger.
smoke or flak bursting around them. Deadly, vicious flak. Precision bombing went on day after day with machine-like regularity. Yes, there were losses, plenty of them. Some ships never made it back to base, and some got there with the fuselage torn almost in half, or the landing gear blown away. For the men waiting on the ground, there's the constant fear that the next landing may be a crash landing. Ambulance crews are on the alert. There's a pilot with both legs shot away, but he's still trying to bring that plane in. thing he did in his lifetime, but he brought her in. Yes. Inferiorum baptisma and remissionum peccatorum, et expecto resurrectionum mortuorum, et vitam venturi seculi. Amen. Dominus obiscum. 
There's a time for battle and a time for prayer. Last Easter Sunday, our boys were fighting on the sands of Africa, thousands of miles from their homes, from those they love and those who love them. These are the conquerors of Africa, the men who followed in the footsteps of the Roman legions and the savage Huns of another era and of today. Yet they want no loot, no stolen world, but a free world for all men. They have made no conquest. Without conquest, they have won the hearts and minds of men. They want no Superman, but a race of all peoples, united in a common aim. This is their prayer. Peace on earth. Peace with victory.